Lesson 4 for July 15 through to 21, Justification by Faith Alone. Sabbath afternoon, July 15. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we've thanked you so many times that Jesus came and lived and died that each of us could have eternal life. And that is through the justification that comes by faith alone. And Paul writes about it just so much. And in Galatians, we hear about it so many times. As we study this lesson this week, we pray that our hearts may be opened, your Holy Spirit will speak to us, and your word will come alive. Bless us, each one, in our daily activities and in our walk with you, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is my favourite text, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's read that again, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. As we saw last week, Paul publicly confronted Peter in Antioch for the lack of consistency between the faith he advocated and the behaviour he displayed. Peter's decision not to eat with former pagans suggested that they were second-rate Christians at best. His actions implied that if they really wanted to be part of the family of God and enjoy the blessings of full-table fellowship, they must first submit to the rite of circumcision. What did Paul actually say to Peter on that tense occasion? In this week's lesson, we will study what is likely a summary of what went on. This passage contains some of the most compressed wording in the New Testament, and it is extremely significant because it introduces us for the first time to several words and phrases that are foundational both to the understanding of the Gospel and the rest of Paul's letter to the Galatians. These key words include justification, righteousness, works of law, belief, and not only faith, but the faith of Jesus. What does Paul mean by these terms, and what do they teach us about the plan of salvation? Sunday, July 16, the question of justification. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. What point do you think he was making? Paul's words need to be understood in their context. In an attempt to win over his fellow Jewish Christians to his position, Paul starts with something they would agree with, the traditional distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Jews were the elect of God, entrusted with his law, and they enjoyed the benefits of the covenant relationship with him. Gentiles, however, were sinners, God's law did not restrain their behaviour, and they were outside the covenants of promise. As we read in Ephesians 2.12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And Romans 2.14 is fairly similar. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. However, while Gentiles were obviously sinners, in verse 16, Paul warns the Jewish Christians that their spiritual privileges do not make them any more acceptable to God because no one is justified by works of the law. Question. 
Paul uses the word justified four times in Galatians 2, verses 16 and 17. What does he mean by justification? Galatians chapter 2, beginning at verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. Let's compare that with Exodus 23, verse 7, Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteousness, for I will not justify the wicked. And Deuteronomy 25, verse 1, If there is a dispute between men, and they come to court, that the judges may judge them, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. The verb to justify is a key term for Paul. Of the 39 times it occurs in the New Testament, 27 are in Paul's letters. He uses it eight times in Galatians, including four references in Galatians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 alone, and we've just read those two verses. Justification, though, is a legal term. It deals with the verdict a judge pronounces when a person is declared innocent of the charges brought against him or her. It is the opposite of condemnation. Additionally, because the words just and righteous come from the same Greek word for a person to be justified, means that the person also is counted as righteous. Thus, justification involves more than simply pardon or forgiveness. It is the positive declaration that a person is righteous. For some of the Jewish believers, however, justification also was relational. It revolved around their relationship with God and his covenant. To be justified also meant that a person was counted as a faithful member of God's covenantal community, the family of Abraham. So to finish today, read Galatians chapter 2 verses 15 through to 17. What is Paul saying to you here? And how can you apply these words to your own Christian experience? Galatians 2, beginning at verse 15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. But if... While we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. Monday, July 17, Works of the Law Question. Paul says three times in Galatians 2.16 that a person is not justified by the works of the law. What does he mean by the expression, the works of the law? How do these texts that we'll read help us understand his meaning? The first is Galatians 2, 16 and 17, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 2, This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? And verse 5, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? And verse 10, 
For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And Romans chapter 3, verse 20, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. And verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Before we can understand the phrase, the works of the law, we first need to understand what Paul means by the word law. The word law, nomos in Greek, is found 121 times in Paul's letters. It can refer to a number of different things, including God's will for his people, the first five books of Moses, the entire Old Testament, or even just a general principle. However, the primary way Paul uses it is to refer to the entire collection of God's commandments given to the people through Moses. The phrase, the works of the law, likely involves, therefore, all the requirements found in the commandments given by God through Moses, whether moral or ceremonial. Paul's point is that no matter how hard we try to follow and obey God's law, our obedience never will be good enough for God to justify us, to have us declared righteous before God. That's because his law requires absolute faithfulness in thought and action, not just some of the time, but all of the time, and not just for some of his commandments, but for all of them. Although the phrase, the works of the law, does not occur in the Old Testament and is not found in the New Testament outside of Paul, Stunning confirmation of its meaning emerged in 1947 with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a collection of writings copied by a group of Jews called Essenes who lived at the time of Jesus. Although written in Hebrew, one of the scrolls contains this exact phrase. The scroll's title is Miskat Mas HaTorah, which can be translated Important Works of the Law. The scroll describes a number of issues concerning the biblical laws regarding the prevention of the desecration of holy things, including several laws that mark the Jews out as separate from the Gentiles. At the end, the author writes that if these works of the law are followed, you will be reckoned righteous before God. Unlike Paul, the author does not offer his reader righteousness on the basis of faith, but on the basis of behaviour. So to finish today, in your experience, how well do you keep God's law? Do you really sense that you keep it so well that you can be justified before God on the basis of your law keeping? If not, why not? And how does your answer help you understand Paul's point here? Just to finish, let's see Romans 3 verses 10 through to 20. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practised deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, if not, why not? And how does your answer help you understand Paul's point here? Tuesday, July 18, the basis of our justification. Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 reads, 
and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. We should not assume Jewish Christians were suggesting that faith in Christ was not important. After all, they were all believers in Jesus. They all had faith in him. Their behaviour showed, however, that they felt faith was not sufficient by itself. It must be supplemented with obedience, as if our obedience adds something to the act of justification itself. Justification, they would have argued, was by both faith and works. The way that Paul repeatedly contrasts faith in Christ with the works of the law indicates his strong opposition to this kind of both-and approach. Faith and faith alone is the basis of justification. For Paul, too, faith is not just an abstract concept. It is inseparably connected to Jesus. In fact, the phrase translated twice as faith in Christ in Galatians chapter 2.16 that we read yesterday is far richer than any translation can really encompass. The phrase in Greek is translated literally as the faith or the faithfulness of Jesus. This literal translation reveals the powerful contrast Paul is making between the works of the law that we do and the work of Christ accomplished in our behalf. The works that he, through his faithfulness, hence the faithfulness of Jesus, has done for us. It's important to remember that faith itself doesn't add to justification, as if faith were meritorious in and of itself. Faith is instead the means by which we take hold of Christ and his works in our behalf. We are not justified on the basis of our faith, but on the basis of Christ's faithfulness for us, which we claim for ourselves through faith. Christ did what every individual has failed to do. He alone was faithful to God in everything he did. Our hope is in Christ's faithfulness, not our own. This is the great and important truth that, among others, ignited the Protestant Reformation. It is a truth that remains as crucial today as it was when Martin Luther began preaching it centuries ago. An early Syriac translation of Galatians 2.16 conveys Paul's meaning well. Therefore, we know that a man is not justified from the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus the Messiah, and we believe in him, in Jesus the Messiah, that from his faith, that of the Messiah, we might be justified and not from the works of the law. And so to finish today, we're going to look at some scripture. First of all, we're going to read Romans chapter 3, verses 22 and 26. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, and verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And Galatians 3.22 But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And Ephesians 3 verse 12 in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. And Philippians 3 verse 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So to finish the day, how do these texts and what we read above help us understand the amazing truth that Christ's faithfulness for us, his perfect obedience to God, is the only basis of our salvation.
Wednesday, July 19, The Obedience of Faith Paul makes it clear that faith absolutely is foundational to the Christian life. It is the means by which we lay hold of the promises we have in Christ. But what is faith exactly? What does it involve? Question. What do the following texts teach us about the origin of faith? First of all, Genesis 15, verses 5 and 6. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And John chapter 3, verses 14 through to 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Genuine biblical faith is always a response to God. Faith is not some kind of feeling or attitude that humans one day decide to have because God requires it. On the contrary, true faith originates in a heart touched with a sense of gratitude and love for God's goodness. That is why, when the Bible talks about faith, that faith always follows initiatives that God has taken. In the case of Abraham, for example, faith is his response to the amazing promises God makes to him, and we read that in Genesis 15. While in the New Testament, Paul says that faith is ultimately rooted in our realization of of what Christ did for us on the cross. Question. If faith is a response to God, what should that response include? Consider what the following texts say about the nature of faith. John 8, verses 32 and 36. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, if the Son makes you free... You shall be free indeed. Acts 10.43 To him all the prophets witness that, through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And Romans 1 verses 5 and 8 Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And Romans 6.17 But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Hebrews 11 verse 6 But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And James 2.19 You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Many people define faith as belief. This definition is problematic, because in Greek, the word for faith is simply the noun form of the verb to believe. To use one form to define the other is like saying, faith is to have faith. It tells us nothing. A careful examination of scripture reveals that faith involves not only knowledge about God, but a mental consent or acceptance of that knowledge. This is one reason why having an accurate picture of God is so important. 
Distorted ideas about the character of God actually can make it more difficult to have faith. But an intellectual assent to the truth of the gospel is not enough. For in that sense, even the demons believe. True, faith also affects the way a person lives. In Romans 1.5, Paul writes about the obedience of faith. Paul is not saying that obedience is the same as faith. He means true faith affects the whole of a person's life, not just the mind. It involves commitment to our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ as opposed to just a list of rules. In other words, faith is as much what we do, how we live and in whom we trust, as it is what we believe. Thursday, July 20. Does faith promote sin? One of the main accusations against Paul was that his gospel of justification by faith alone encouraged people to sin. We read about that in Romans chapter 3 and verse 8. And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. And Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No doubt the accusers reasoned that if people do not have to keep the law to be accepted by God, why should they be concerned with how they live? Luther too faced similar charges. Question. How does Paul respond to the accusation that a doctrine of justification by faith alone encourages sinful behaviour. Let's read Galatians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Paul responds to his opponent's charges in the strongest terms possible. God forbid! While it is possible that a person might fall into sin after coming to Christ, the responsibility would certainly not belong to Christ. If we break the law, we ourselves are the lawbreakers. Question. How does Paul describe his union with Jesus Christ? In what way does this answer refute the objections raised by his opponents? Galatians 2, 19 through to 21. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Paul finds the reasoning of his opponents simply preposterous. Accepting Christ by faith is not something trivial. It is not a game of heavenly make-believe in which God counts a person as righteous while there is no real change in how that person lives. On the contrary... To accept Christ by faith is extremely radical. It involves a complete union with Christ, a union of both his death and his resurrection. Spiritually speaking, Paul says we are crucified with Christ and our old sinful ways, rooted in selfishness, are finished, as we read in Romans 6, verses 5 through to 14. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. 
death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. We have made a radical break with the past, Everything is new, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We have been raised to a new life in Christ, and the resurrected Christ lives within us, making us more and more like himself every day. Faith in Christ, therefore, is not a pretext for sin, but a call to a much deeper, richer relationship with Christ than could ever be found in a law-based religion. So to finish today, how do you relate to the concept of salvation by faith alone without the deeds of the law? Does it perhaps scare you a little, making you think that it can be an excuse for sin? Or do you rejoice in it? What does your answer say about your understanding of salvation? Friday, July 21 From the book Faith and Works by Ellen White, page 18 and 19, we read, The danger has been presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people false ideas of justification by faith. I have been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the mind on this point. The law of God has been largely dwelt upon and has been presented to congregations almost as destitute of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his relation to the law, as was the offering of Cain. I have been shown that many have been kept from the faith because of the mixed, confused ideas of salvation, because the ministers have worked in a wrong manner to reach hearts. The point that has been urged upon my mind for years is the imputed righteousness of Christ. There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated with frequency, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And from the same writer, from Selected Messages, Book 1, page 367. The law demands righteousness, and this the sinner owes to the law, but he is incapable of rendering it. The only way in which he can attain to righteousness is through faith. By faith he can bring to God the merits of Christ, and the Lord places the obedience of his Son to the sinner's account. Christ's righteousness is accepted in place of man's failure, and God receives pardons, justifies the repentant, believing soul, treats him as though he were righteous, and loves him as he loves his son. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, in the first passage quoted above, Ellen White says no subject needs to be emphasised more than justification by faith. As a class, discuss whether her comments are as applicable for us today as they were when she wrote them more than a hundred years ago, and if so, why? Two, think about the Protestant Reformation and Luther. However different the time and place and circumstances, why was the truth that Paul presented here so crucial a factor in freeing millions from the spiritual bondage of Rome? And to summarise this week's lesson, Peter's behaviour in Antioch suggested that ex-pagans could not be true Christians unless they were first circumcised. 
Paul pointed out the fallacy of such thinking, God cannot pronounce anyone righteous on the basis of that person's behaviour, for even the best humans are not perfect. It is only by accepting what God has done for us in Christ that we sinners can be justified in his sight. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled David's Amazing Discovery Part 1 David Pan stared at the words in the Bengali language Bible The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God As a teacher in a traditional Christian faith David was amazed he had never noticed these words What does it mean? Which day was the seventh day? According to his calendar, the seventh day was Saturday. He didn't know anyone who worshipped on Saturday. I must ask the bishop about this, he told his wife, Swamra. Surely he'll have an answer. Forget what the Bible says, the bishop advised David. Continue to worship on Sunday as you've always done. The bishop's answer puzzled David even more. Why was the bishop unwilling to discuss the Sabbath with me, he wondered. On arriving home, David shared his perplexity with his wife. The Bible says plainly that we should keep the seventh day holy, but the bishop couldn't give me a satisfying answer to why we worship on Sunday. I don't know what to do. Perhaps we should fast and pray about it, his wife suggested. If we've been worshipping on the wrong day, God will show us. As David and Swano fasted and prayed, the conviction remained that they should worship on the seventh day Sabbath. The next day, a visitor came to their house. Have you ever heard of a church that worships on Saturday, the seventh day of the week? David asked him. Yes, the visitor replied. There's a church in Calcutta that holds services on Saturday. The visitor gave the church's address. The next Saturday morning, David and Swama went to Calcutta and found the church. They were delighted to find people there studying the Bible. After the service, the couple visited with a businessman named John and his wife. During their conversation, David and Swama told them of their search for truth. We want someone to come to our home to tell us more about why you keep Saturday, David said. We'll come, John promised. Soon afterward, John and another man visited David and Swama in their home. Before long... David and his family invited John and a friend to hold Sabbath services in their home. A few others from the church in Calcutta came to support the couple in their search for truth. Satisfied that the Seventh-day Adventist church was teaching Bible truth, David resigned his job as a teacher in his church and began sharing the Sabbath truth with others. After more than seven months of study, David and Swarma were baptised along with many others with whom they had shared their new faith. And it sounds like the story's ended, but it continues next week. Remember, God is always faithful. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harrell. It was recorded in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind. This podcast is brought to you by the Sabbath School Department and through the services of Hope Channel.